Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, difficult invitation. The invitation when it came was um, um, challenging. Uh, it said, well, we want to hear something new. Uh, we want to hear something about the future. Mm, how the digital is um, interacting with um, uh, our current challenges and whether there's a, a view or, or a way forward uh, when it comes to a mature information society like uh, this and a world that is becoming certainly increasingly digital but is not forgetting the analog either. So this is, to put it mildly, work in progress. Uh, I wish I had a full answer to that question, uh, but I thought I couldn't miss the opportunity to discuss with you at least some of the ideas that hopefully will push us in the right direction. The talk, as you will see, is divided in a few blocks. Uh, there will be a very quick and short introduction, uh, which is mainly to be on the same page. I know you know, so that will be just a, a bit of warming up. Uh, then I would like to highlight uh, five challenges, broad challenges, which should uh, sort of invite us to think that something needs to be done in terms of um, new policies, or perhaps shall we dare to use the, the P word, politics, uh, for the future. Uh, and after that, a perspective from which I believe it might be useful to look at the new politics for an information society, and a quick conclusion to show you perhaps a possible direction for an answer, although I'm still working on that. So in terms of, um, uh, and I hope, yes, what I'm seeing is what you're seeing. Um, in terms of uh, where we are today, uh, we used to be there. Uh, the computer used to be around us. We used to walk inside a computer in order to make it work. And uh, the relationship with the computer was um, a physical one. Uh, as we all know, especially the old ones here, uh, uh, software engineering was a, was a screwdriver enterprise. Um, uh, then uh, the daughter of uh, uh, that lady um, walked out of the computer and uh, the computer started becoming something that you had in front of you, not something within which you were working. But today we are back inside and we're never going to leave that. That is a turning point. In other words, we live inside a computer, this big, huge thing that we might call uh, sort of the on-life experience. And uh, I call it on-life uh, to be explained in a moment because um, it has become pointless to ask, as we used to do in the 90s, are you online or are you offline? Uh, well, seriously, I'm driving, I'm using a GPS, downloading music, Perhaps someone is talking to me on my mobile phone, hands on, on the wheel, of course, uh, and, uh, uh, and you're asking me whether I'm online or offline, you must be from the 90s. Clearly, you have enjoyed the 21st century. So we live on life increasingly, more people, more places, and I know that there's always someone in the hall who says, oh, surely you forget that some people have never made a telephone call. No, I don't. I do remember that some people have made a telephone call, and there are millions of those. What I'm saying here is that the life of those who never made a telephone call is determined by those who have. In other words, those who do not live on life have their life determined by those who do live in societies where on life is becoming an ordinary experience. And I'm not saying this with a cheer. I'm not saying, oh, that's a good thing. I'm just saying that's the way the world is going. Um, in that on life world, and again, this is just uh, to warm you up because I know you know, we've been enveloping the world, and this is the right place where not to explain what an envelope is, but just in case, in mechanical engineering, uh, in robotics, is the 3D space within which a robot is successful. Uh, no robot engineer ever dreams of, I hope, unleashing a robot in the road and say, oh, just find me a car and please paint the car because I need no, a new car on that car. What you do is you build a whole special architecture around those robots so that those robots are successful. And that architecture means that you do not walk inside unless you know what you're doing because uh, those robots are not particularly careful. Now, they may you know, 
chop you into pieces. Uh, they were there to paint that car. So enveloping the world is what has happening for the past decades. And that's why our technology is so successful and will be more and more successful. Not because it adapts to the world very well, but because the world is adapting to it increasingly. It's one thing to catalogue you know, millions of pictures in an analogue library, virtually impossible. But when it comes to all those zebras and cats that are digital, well, a piece of software can do it pretty easily. Or at least we know that now can. So we'll not forget that we don't have robots that can deal with the world. We have a world that is increasingly IT friendly and it's getting more and more friendly. Now, that's why, in terms of space, we really live in the infosphere, no, in, uh, in a world that is made of information, increasingly so. And in terms of time, we have abandoned history, uh, in some places, this included, to live in a, a hyperhistorical society. Hyperhistorical meaning that we not only uh, consider our welfare as a society, our well being as individual, connected to ICT, that's, that will be history. But it's actually dependent upon it. And that's why it's even more historical than history itself. Remember that prehistory, the definition is any society that lives without the ability of recording the present for future consumption. In other words, they don't know how to write. We left that society 6,000 years ago. We are now at the stage of leaving history behind. In 6,000 years, they will look back and say, oh, that was the time when hyperhistory started. I know it's a bit, no, fast forward, but that's what philosophy is for. No? So I think it's quite useful to have an, an analogy here. So where, where are we? And I thought the best way, uh, especially because in Oxford you never see that kind of water and that kind of weather, uh, I thought, well, maybe it's important to realize that this is analog and digital, they're mixed together. Uh, the word in English for that particular water, kind of water, is brackish. Brackish water is neither salty nor sweet. It's where the river meets the sea. And that's where the mangrove society is growing. It's a bit messy. Uh, we thought we could let it grow and then regulate. Big mistake. But now we're taking care of it a little bit late. Uh, but better late than never. And why is brackish water? Because asking there, remember that question, are you online? Asking where the river meets the sea, is, this wa is the water sweet or salty? Means you do not understand where you are. You're not deep down in the sea and you're not up in the river. You are where those things are meeting. And this sort of uh, brackish space, this mangrove society is growing, is where everybody is coming slowly. So that was the introduction. There are a few challenges here, of course. I like to list five, uh, mainly because um, uh, normally things come other in five because we have one five fingers on one hand, or ten because we have two hands. Uh, that's mammalian kind of counting for you. So five, I think it comes as a nice number. Uh, I'm sure some of you can think of six or seven and eight, but I hope I group some of them in a way that at least makes everybody feel we need to do something here. And it's not scaremongering. Uh, actually, believe it or not, this is supposed to be an optimistic look uh, at the future. So first of all, um, the infosphere, and I've told you what that uh, means, uh, uh, is becoming a huge, immense social experiment. We do things uh, in the infosphere that you would not be allowed to do in a lab. In fact, you can do things uh, through a BBC program that no uh, neuroscientist will be allowed, in terms of ethics, to do in a lab. What is good information behavior online? That is up to us to uh, understand and uh, develop. Um, things like fake news or um, electing uh, uh, a strange individual uh, to the White House, well, that is part of good information behavior or luck thereof. So uh, you can tell that the social experiment is not going particularly well. Uh, I shall not say a word about the idiocy of Brexit. Um, but in that context, um, let me be realistic about what that means. These are some uncontroversial data, as far as science is concerned. It shows you where we're going to live uh, in the next few years. If you can't read uh, at the bottom on the right, um, that says 2050, so it's a bit of a projection. That blue line shows uh, the distribution of human population on this planet 
we are not going anywhere, uh, despite some uh, singularist thinking that that's the best solution for environmental problems. Uh, drop this planet, find another one to destroy. Yes, thank you, that's brilliant. Um, so in that context, um, these smart environments are very fragile. I don't have to remind, remind this audience, because you know, that we're building piles on piles of technologies not always sure that the bottom is as robust as it should be. Anyone who has been exposed to um, the way, for example, traffic control is structured nationally, let's say in the UK, knows very well that that technology is pretty old and some of the bits there of the software, uh, we're not quite sure how they were put that in the first place and uh, do we really have anyone in the office who knows that particular language because, um, I don't know, that was uh, something that we don't speak anymore, etc. So um, all those things, opening big data, smart algorithm, AI, machine learning, smart sensors, cloud computing, they're all there to prepare these enormous uh, environments, which are mega cities. And the mega cities will be mega structure. They will depend enormously on the work done in universities like this. Fragility, vulnerability will be a the day uh, business. In that context, uh, we're going to see a bit of polarization. We're already seeing it uh, almost anywhere. Certainly, for example, the, the difference between, say, London, uh, which knows uh, that we should be in uh, uh, Europe, there's no other place, and the rest of the country, who, of course, is blind to it. Uh, so uh, the rural uh, becomes more um, sort of uh, backyard, uh, then there's a bit of urban, and the hyper-urban infosphere. Now there, the kind of the issues that you find from a philosophical perspective is fairness and opportunities. Uh, it actually makes a difference, as I discovered recently, that if you want to sell some stuff on eBay and you live downtown in Oxford, that's much easier than if you live in the countryside and says, come and collect it. Nobody comes and collects your fridge uh, in the middle of nowhere because it's not convenient, not even if it is that cheap, but if you're downtown. So here, what we find in terms of smart cities, for example, and uh, these new structures that we're building, is that there's something that is becoming increasingly invisible. And that's normally any presentation you go to for a smart city, you will never be presented with a bluish side or the one in the middle. Uh, who has ever heard of a smart suburbia? Right. Uh, the smart city looks always like the bottom right. It's beautiful, it's clean, it's all built yesterday. Um, the only places where they are building smart cities like that uh, is South Korea. Uh, that's not a joke. I mean, they have a piece of land. They say, well, I like a smart city there. How many people? Oh, 400,000. Thank you. And then two years later, thank you. Here are the key. But if the alternative, which is, for example, Barcelona, the, the smart city sort of example in Europe, is in question, then you're dealing with a very old uh, structure that doesn't look exactly like that picture. So what remains invisible, remains opaque, what is salient, the responsibilities, the opportunities will be a challenge. What we need to remember is that the old and the new, the obsolete and the futuristic will be messy. And that's something that technology tends uh, to suggest is not going to be the future. The future is um, uh, Blade Runner. Uh, it's a mixed bag, inevitably, of all the new, of compromises. In that context, the sort of agency that we're going to find in these um, uh, environments is going to be increasingly mixed. The human, the biological, the artificial uh, will uh, become uh, a little bit more interactive. There will be competition and there will be collaboration. I don't know if you saw, because it made news in, in the UK, but uh, probably nowhere else, uh, we, we published a paper recently with some colleagues on uh, uh, even good bots fight. Uh, is a study of how bots uh, who want to collaborate, who are written by collaborative people on Wikipedia to do good editing, can't get together. And so I'm a bot and I take that comma away. I'm a bot and I put it back and I take it away and I put it back and I put it away. And that goes on forever until someone finally unplugs the whole stupid machinery and says, enough. So uh, that little sort of study, which I recommend as a sort of little um, test of the future, shows that competition and collaboration do not come just bottom up as emergent properties. 
without some intervention in terms of designing good rules so to make sure that if we want to open the door and we are on the two sides, at some point we're not both pulling. Because if we're both pulling, that door doesn't go anywhere. And yes, I want to open it, yes, you want to open it. So uh, some coordination there uh, between uh, old past environments, those were the days, uh, my grandmother uh, still remembered uh, a time when uh, there were no cars. And going to Rome meant you know, finding a horse somewhere. The present environment, where those cars are uh, essentially not driverless yet, uh, and it's unclear what's going to happen there, but surely they are hoovering massive amount of data by the minute, and that is the real headache at the moment. And of course the shared environment, um, and for those of you who haven't seen that around, it's already been tested in London uh, by Amazon. Uh, it's a delivery robot, uh, and honestly, if you think of it, it's not that smart. I mean, you need to take A from one point to another point. Uh, a robot could do that. You don't need the most amazing thing ever created in the universe, namely a human brain to do it. Um, so what happens in terms of governance of this? <clears throat> I think here we have a bit of a, a mismatch. There are lots of issues here, but let me highlight only one. A bit of mismatch between the top-down supply, uh, e-governance from uh, uh, the local authorities, from, uh, from the government, and the bottom-up demand. Uh, so e-governance and democracy will be one of the main challenges here. Uh, and I'm not, uh, in fact, talking about uh, anything like direct democracy. Uh, direct democracy is normally a big mistake. Um, we come from the idea that we don't have direct democracy just because uh, we cannot be all together in the same square, possibly in Athens, uh, possibly 5th century uh, BC. Well, it never was that way, as we all know. Well, democracy in Athens was a little game for a few male citizens who could vote and are uh, liable to be subject to military service. Women were not included, slaves were not included, barbarians were not included. That was the democracy we so much so earned to reproduce. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, the democracy we have is, uh, of course, representative because we want to make sure that uh, the power is distributed as much as possible. Uh, representative democracy is about the distribution of power, not the management of power. A subtle distinction that has been missed by Brexit. Uh, so you want to make sure that uh, all the power uh, is distributed as much as possible, and then consensus is built. Uh, if you miss the two movements, it's a mess. Um, here, some kind of tolerant, capital T, paternalism will probably have to play a role. In other words, you will have to allow people to do whatever they want, but at the same point, you will have to be able to say, look, that's a bad idea. Uh, and I do not recommend you to jump out of the window because that's the fifth floor and you will not land safely. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Shall I try once? No, because once is too late. Um, I would recommend it to my children, certainly. So are you being intolerant? Yes, I am. Uh, uh, why? For your sake. So something along those lines will have to be developed. Uh, oh, mind that you cannot say this too loudly. I mean, who, who wants to limit tolerance these days. I mean, um, and remember that this is said not at the beginning, but at the end of the toleration process. Of course, everybody wants to be tolerant. It's just that you need to make sure that that tolerance doesn't undermine itself. John Locke, who actually gave us the uh, toleration uh, perspective, said once, you have to be tolerant towards everybody but the Catholics. Uh, because, of course, they are intolerant, and if they get power, you're screwed. Um, he had a point. Uh, so, do not get me wrong. I'm not not saying that tolerance is not uh, the key uh, to the future. I'm saying we need to be careful about not talking about tolerance as if you were mum and apple pie, never criticize. No, that's silly. Uh, that means being naive about it. And finally, a bit about the world in which we live. Uh, the natural, the artificial, the synthetic realities. We will have to develop some kind of environmental ethics where the joke on the E dash is not Heideggerian. Uh, it's just a reminder that the E in environmental may actually be more than we uh, think. Environmental ethics tends to be about valleys and trees and forgets, uh, tends to forget at least, cities, buildings, this kind of place. Uh, it shouldn't, uh, because at the moment, this is the most recent data I've been able to find until um, now. 
it's kind of old data, uh, but at least it's reliable data. All you need to see here is the light green and the dark green. The light green is what ICT is doing for the environment. It's the saving hand in terms of uh, a lighter no, impact in terms of uh, pollution and so on. The dark green is what uh, you find uh, in terms of uh, uh, negative impact is, um, well, the electricity coming from somewhere. Good old days, not now that we have sophisticated computers, but good old days, oh, I remember getting really hot on my legs with that laptop because, of course, uh, all that energy uh, has to be consumed. Um, that is the negative impact. So, at the moment, in terms of environmental issues, what we are really doing is taking uh, a bet. We hope that the dark green at the bottom will not cause so much damage and will be so much counterbalanced by the light green at the top that then we will save the patient without killing the patient. Is this is a reference to uh, personal experiences, uh, so I'm quite serious about it. It's what happens when you see someone being treated for cancer. You hope that the treatment is going to kill the cancer before it kills the patient. That is the kind of race we are running at this day. So when everyone says, oh, ICT is so wonderful, the environment, yes, to some extent, it comes with a cost. And that cost is part of the problem. So you really hoping that you're going to get there faster than you are undermining, as you were, your uh, bridge. It's one of those cartoons when the cartoon is running on a bridge and the bridge is collapsing behind, but it runs so fast that it can still not go on the other side of the divide. To get there, uh, I recently recommended uh, these four steps, very elementary, uh, to any company that wants to hear. Uh, and there are more and more companies that want to hear. Your project shouldn't be just feasible. Uh, as in resources available. It shouldn't be just sustainable in terms of uh, your green impact. It should be socially at least acceptable. People should be able to say, okay, uh, I don't mind. And possibly, if you really are a good company, it should be socially preferable. So imagine next time you buy uh, a service for your company or for your university, etc., and it comes with a blue stamp that says, socially preferable. Oh, I like that. Do I need to check? No, someone somewhere is checking. In the same way I, as someone somewhere is checking that the food I'm buying from the supermarket is sustainable. So I would like to see that in the future and we are working with some companies going in that direction of some sort of um, uh, certification for the environmentalism that I've shown you before. It can be done as a step forward and hopefully we'll see it. All this comes, however, at a time of crisis. Um, we used to think that um, the human rights that are lying behind all this, the beautiful declaration of human rights, were like columns in a temple, possibly Greek temple, although coming from Rome, it doesn't have to be Greek. Uh, but, uh, well, we learn from them. So, uh, uh, For those of you who are uh, keen on the history of mathematics, of course we had had a foundational crisis before in mathematics. I won't tell you anything about that if you haven't heard of it, but it shows that even when two plus two comes to four, we weren't quite sure what we were doing. Now, imagine how more complicated it is with human rights. With our foundational crisis, and I'm getting to the uh, sort of more political point, uh, looks like this. Snowden, freedom of expression and information not being compatible with security. Apple, FBI, security not being compatible with privacy. Privacy, freedom of expression and information not being compatible because of Google right to be forgotten. And recently, uh, Facebook and Trump uh, self-determination. How far do we want to go? until politics through social media, it's a bit too far. Now, this shows that uh, we need some rethinking. We need a bit of an architecture. Remember, those are the challenges. How do we approach them? We need to rethink a little bit how the human rights are put together. We thought we were great friends that would get along. We never organized the party. Well, the digital has finally organized the party and discovered these are not really good friends. They don't get along too easily. So somehow we need to find a way of putting more depth into something that looks at the moment just a certain line. Every human rights is as good as any other. You don't put one on top, one next. There's only one bit of um, depth in the Declaration of Human Rights, and that's provided by human dignity. If you look at the document, uh, human dignity is outside the human rights, is as where the perspective 
the angle from which you look at human rights. It sort of supports the human rights idea. Say, oh, that's great. Okay, so we can reorganize, say, uh, for example, privacy in terms of uh, our digital ethics uh, in across the board, and I'm just picking up one example, and say, well, it's about human dignity. And then the next question comes, okay, well, what, what do you mean by human dignity? Well, because we are exceptional. Uh, we are exceptional, therefore this human dignity, therefore there are all these human rights, for example, privacy, and therefore those challenges should be addressed in terms of this package. So, well, more or less, that makes some sense, but you need to tell me what that exceptionalism is in the 21st century, because it's not trivial. Exceptionalism, and you can see you know, we're stepping back in terms of conditions or possibility of what we need to do, um, it used to be something about pretty much enlightenment, Kantian, for those of you who are acquainted with the philosophical side of it, idea that we are autonomous, that we are in charge, we can determine our lives. Uh, but so does it. If you look at that list, autonomy as self-determination, self-regulation, learning in the real sense, in the engineering sense, rule changing, adaptability, smart tasking in the no, deep sort of, uh, learning sort of thing. Uh, these are things that are done pretty well by machines today. So if we are exceptional for these reasons, well, we're no longer exceptional. And unless we find another way of finding ourselves exceptional, we are missing the ground on which human dignity is built, on which the human rights are built, on which a solution for the information society will be built. In that process, we are missing the very first step. And if you think that this is impossible, how did we get it so wrong? And remember that the foundational crisis in mathematics took some of the greatest minds in uh, our history to be left unresolved, okay? So we don't have a solution yet. So if it gets so wrong or so difficult in two plus two equal four, imagine when the human rights is in question. Why that challenge? Uh, this has something I've said more than once, and I forgive me uh, if some of you, uh, I know at least two colleagues here who have heard me saying this a thousand times. Um, well, we used to think that we were exceptional in their sort of autonomous Kantian blah, blah, blah sense because we were at the center, at the center of the universe. Not really, Copernicus. At the center of the biological kingdom, of the biosphere. Uh, not really, Darwin. At the center of our mental life. Nope. Uh, Freud. We had one more area where we thought we were at the center, and that was the area of agency. We thought no one can play chess like us. No one is going to drive the car like us. No one can park so badly like my uncle, etc. So that was the idea that no, we were special because of the smart agency that only us fly their thing, uh, shoot their guy, etc. Well, the thing is that, as we know, from Alan Turing onwards, that exceptionalism, it's been eroded constantly. In fact, today, it's gone. How many times have you been uh, exposed to the question, what computers can or cannot do, really? Are we really stuck with that thing? Of course they can do almost anything we can think of. It's how they do it, not what they do, that makes a difference. I wouldn't bet on anything not being doable by a computer better than not half of the friends I know. Uh, surely I bet already, as you know, there's a better chef out there, which I've seen, that cook better than all my friends, certainly all my English friends. So, uh, honestly, uh, chef or English colleague, chef any time. Uh, the computerized one. Because that, the other guy doesn't even know how to put the pasta in the water. So, in that sense, there is no limit to what computers can or cannot do. It's how they're going to do it. And what about us? Uh, aren't we at the center of something? Remember all that lying, like that, that pie? Uh, all the information society is challenges, the human rights, the human dignity, the exceptionalism, bingo, we don't have an exception, so the whole thing do, 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 is going to collapse. Surely there must be a perspective. Well, I'm suggesting you that that perspective could be anthropo-eccentric. We don't need to be at the center of the game anymore. We can grow up, we don't need to be teenagers. Now, the teenager attitude is me. What's in it for me? What should I do? Who should I be? Why should I do it? Um, as long as you ask those questions, you haven't really entered the ethical discourse because the whole point here is about what's the right thing to do for the receiver. So here is um, a quick reference, because I know time is flying, to um, 
the manifesto of the Renaissance. The gentleman in question is unknown to most of us. He's a philosopher, but you shouldn't have heard of him. Um, but the actual oration is quite famous. It's uh, where the Renaissance sort of gave itself its own identity. In that context, he talks about us humans being neither angels, those were the days, well, angels, in a reference to angels, made a lot of sense, uh, nor brutes, animals, or robots, as you would say today. Okay, well, if we're not really in the chain, if we're not uh, there, where can we place ourselves? Remember, we're talking about this exceptional nature that will be linked to all the rest of the discourse. There's a beautiful word in, uh, in Greek, um, polytropos, and I know it's been a little while since you read the Odyssey, but just in case, uh, uh, that is the first line of the Odyssey when Ulysses is introduced. And uh, uh, we are told that he is the Polytropos man, a man of many venues and traveling, who has acquired that experience by being in many places, have seen many cultures, has moved around, uh, streetwise, as it were. We don't have a single word in English for that. But it does show that the sort of ethics that we're talking about, if you're not at the center, but you are at the periphery, if you are outside, if you're looking at what needs to be taken care of, rather than you, no, what's in it for me, but rather what can I do for it, then the sort of ethics we're talking about is a traveler's ethics. You are in, your, in the hands of your host, you have a right to protection and hospitality. That sounds good. Your dignity becomes being the master of your own journey keep your identity, your choices open. Which also means, back to our particular technology, that any technology that tries to profile you, it's taking away the poly from tropos. It's removing the you know, variety, the uh, sophistication, the multiplicity of your experiences into say, you are a cat or a dog lover. And that's it. Oh, you know, I really like zebras. No, that's too late. No, no, zebras, not for you. I'm going to sell you food for dog, uh, books for dogs, uh, holidays for dogs, and although, no, since yesterday you really love zebras, that's too late. Because I can't cope with that. Uh, any reference to Facebook is uh, wanted. Um, so, uh, manipulating that kind of openness is uh, ruining our personal identity, and human dignity as polytropy. I know it sounds a little bit philosophical, but no, welcome to the beginning of this uh, two days. Provides the anthropo-eccentric foundation, which I hope now starts making sense, for the right to privacy, for example, and individual control over our own constitutive information. Our information is not ours as in my car, is mine as in my hand. It makes me who I am, uh, so it's not something I can sell uh, uh, easily. Of course, that means that the other side is a caring stewardship. If you are a traveler and you go to someone else's house, the, the first thing you have to do is to be a careful sort of host. Uh, you don't want to sort of make a mess. So privacy on the one hand and caring to your ship on the other, well, that starts looking like a, a bit of a project. Um, what about us then in this context? And I'm coming to the end of this um, uh, talk. I want to leave open the possibility that we might be designed by a superpower up in the sky. Uh, if you have that belief, you're welcome to that belief. And I'm serious about this. I used to be Catholic. And some of my best friends are Catholics. And lawyers. Uh, but, um, but I like to keep open also the alternative. That we might be here, seriously, totally, accidentally, as a fluke. It shouldn't have happened. It won't happen again. It was a mistake. It's a beautiful mistake. It's a glitch, but glitch it is. And if you look at the you know, distribution of animals on this planet, in fact, of what happens in this universe, we're quite unique as in the outlier, the nail that sticks out, that should be hammered. Now, the thing that really is not making too much sense, whether it doesn't make any sense because it's a fluke and a mistake and a glitch, or because someone made that mistake with a purpose in mind, and I leave it to you. But that a mistake it is, and an exception it is, well, I don't think we have much uh, of a doubt. So if we are nature's beautiful glitch, well, for the Java people in, in the room, we really are the non-fatal exception, which is rare, really rare. 
So it's as if a software went bananas, and by going bananas, work a little bit better. Oh, that's really unlikely. I know. Oh, well, welcome to the human condition. That's why we shouldn't be here. And that's why it's not going to happen again. It's the lottery ticket. You win once. Uh, it's not a business plan, no, winning twice. So uh, that, uh, seems to me, um, makes much more sense in terms of being in the periphery, we are the glitch. But then, as such, we can also consider ourselves more information organisms, certainly in the 21st century. We're not only information organisms, of course not. Thank you so much. I mean, I received that objection in the past. So you think we're just a bunch of data? Of course not. But exactly in the same way as when 20 years ago or 30 by now, I was told, oh, Luciano, you're really just about 90% water and a little bit of else. And I rebelled against that. I said, no, surely I'm not. It's like 80, 80 or 70 liters of water plus no, a jar of Nescafe, no, made of other chemicals. So, of course not. But there's a chemical view of the human being, which is water. And there's a, an informational view of the human being, which is an informational organism. And they are complementary. In that sense, if and insofar as we are information organisms, then our identities and lives are informationally fragile, very fragile. Don't listen to economists. We're not rational, we're not robust, we do not make up my mind according to the axioms of choice theory. Uh, we are totally fragile and influential. That's why nudging is incredibly powerful, and social pressure and so on. So if you have a technology that, by definition, has its business, managing, producing, processing information. And on the other hand, you have an organism that is made of information. What do you think is going to happen when you put the two together? Well, you better be careful, because one will manipulate the other. One will influence the other. That's why the Human Project, and I come to the conclusion, I can see that uh, we're getting nervous down there, uh, the Human Project must be friendly to the beautiful glitch. We need to be careful. So the conclusion is this. <coughs> and this is the most tentative moment in the whole talk. I think capitalism is a good engine. There, I said it. It's consumerism that is not good. But the digital has this beautiful ability of detaching things, of making A and B that used to be a single thing, territoriality and the law, apart. Presence and location, apart. Ownership and usage, split apart. Capitalism and consumerism, maybe we can separate the two. And maybe instead of uh, just keeping the one as a bundle, we could keep the capitalism as the right engine, but transform that from a, a capitalism, analog capitalism geared towards consumerism to a digital capitalism geared towards caring stewardship. I don't have a word for that in English. I hope that the Swedish might provide one. I've been asking this for the past few months. There is no word for that in Japanese, I'm told. I've already asked that question. But foster is a good compromise. You foster as a father or mother kids. You take care of them if they're not your own. So from consumerism to fosterism as a digital project for the future of humanity, it could be worse. Thank you. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you. So, uh, Julia and Joseph, you're going to take the microphones. And I'm just looking to see if we've got any hands. Any hands? Any questions? Yes, we've got one. Up there in the blue shirt. Yes, uh, in retrospect, it seems that we're being quite optimistic uh, about the uh, rich or knowledge that it's only one click away uh, to get the proper knowledge to be part of the elections and so on. Uh, it seems that knowledge is not only one thing away, you must have more than that. Uh, how do you see on the future uh, challenges uh, about this? Uh, could you could you try again? Because the microphone didn't help much. So if you kept, keep the mouth the, the mouth a little bit further away from oh. from you and then try because I, I didn't quite grasp what you meant. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems that it's, it's not where it's going right now. Uh, 
Yes, I, I, I grasp the point now. Um, we used to think, uh, when the few of us were doing this, this work in the past, that internet uh, would have provided that sort of um, knowledge to everyone. That availability of information and accessibility of information would have made a political difference. What we forgot in one, two, three, available is there, accessible, you can get it, political difference. We forgot a fundamental element, which is inertia, human inertia. You need to have a reason to check. Otherwise, you stay home flipping channels. And that's been true since Plato's cave. So it's not a novelty. Now, uh, you read Francis Bacon's uh, sort of, uh, Idols of the Market, and he has the same analysis of fake news. It's just 500 years old. Uh, you know, humans uh, will kill each other and will not want to do more than just being on a beach you know, uh, drinking margarita. That is the human being you need to address. If you have that kind of perspective, then there's a hope. If we have, the, as a perspective, we have about seven billion Socrates walking around just waiting for the information to arrive, then we are deluded. Uh, so most of us will not give a rat's ass about any information whatsoever unless they have to. We do not change, for example, meters in the UK when you save 100 or 120 uh, pounds, not quite sure about pounds, um, but one click. And it's just saving, moving from that electric, electricity provider to that electricity provider. It's simple, it's free, and it saves you money. We don't do it. Inertia. So what we need to do is to build an environment where that inertia is fought, where you motivate people to get the information they need. As long as uh, clickbait, we're not going to go anywhere. Thank you. Uh, and I just need to say that uh, the sound from the microphones from when we're up at stage is not really very crisp. So when you pose a question, and I also would like you to say your name and where, where you work, but just that, and then try and make the, the question very crisp because it's a bit hard to hear it from here. Thank you. That's okay. Oh, Joe, just wait. It's probably going to go on. Hello. Is it me you're looking for? Okay, so maybe it's not on then. Oh, it's off. Change the microphone. Thank you. I connecting everything together, all this information, uh, then a system that is a little bit more clever will erase us. Because we are the most uh, threatening thing for the machine. So what do you think about that? <laughs> so um, again, I'm not quite sure that I, the microphone helped, uh, but in terms of uh, IoT, things getting smarter by the day, uh, replacing us by the day, um, you can see this as an opportunity and a, and a challenge. The opportunity is to uh, implement Plan A, which has been Plan A for basically millennia since we started this journey, which was to stop working. We never wanted to work. No, have you ever seen a description of paradise where you sweat? No. A utopian place is where you are on holiday 24-7. Now, that was plan A always. The problem with that is that if you don't work, bam, you don't have a salary. Oh, that is the problem. <laughs> it's not that I don't have a job, it's that I don't have a salary. Uh, well, if I can get a salary without having a job, which is mostly what bureaucrats you know, aim for, uh, then, then, no, bingo, then I'm done. And that, that leads towards you no know, universal basic income uh, or something like millennia and you know, thousands of generations of human beings have been working really hard to put us here. Uh, how are we going to share this you know, legacy? Because at the moment, we're not sharing it properly. The inequality is indecent. So that is plan A. There's also a bit of plan B, which is 
a little bit less uh, sort of uh, en enticing, which is, okay, well, maybe we need to keep working. Um, but it's sort of work for the future. Remember, from consumerism to you know, uh, caring for the world, we will be increasingly employed in caring, minding, strategic sort of context, where it could be anything from serving the right glass of cold water to someone uh, at a bar, all the way up to being you know, the prime minister. But that caring, that sort of minding, then being at the service of, that is probably the future of our jobs. But it means shifting the whole society from consuming the world to caring for the world. If we do that, the future is ours. So either plan A or plan B are good plans. The only plan that is not going to happen is like us, you know, with robots doing anything for us, us on the beach. Uh, unfortunately, that is not gonna, it doesn't look like. Thank you, Luciano. I think our time is out. So while we shift computers, I would just... Thank you. you if you'd come over here, and I could yep. say thank you to you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And I, I just want to say... <laughs> there you are. Oh, thank you. you. I will get a present. Some chocolate. Speaking of caring, thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you for giving us such, such important questions for bringing us into the future and the discussions today. Because isn't that something that we all have to think about? We're so prone to giving answers to everything, but we don't think about the questions. And I've got several new questions to think about what digitization means to our society and to, to ourselves. So our next